from WRAL News, this is Focal Point. We depend on farming for food, and most farmers depend on pesticides to grow it. You have diseases, you have weeds, you have insects. Agricultural experts say pesticides are safe if used properly. If they're not used as labeled, then they do have the potential of causing great harm, either to human health or to the environment. Some of the humans at greatest risk are farm workers and their families. Mariada. I used to feel um, dizzy. Yep, I'm vomiting. I used to have uh, like a rash on my, on my arms. But what about the long-term effects of pesticide exposure? Definitely the, the migratory nature of the farm workers makes it harder to figure out the chronic effects of pesticides because they're just not there in the future years to see the effect of it. When it comes to worker safety, advocates say some farmers cross the line to maintain the bottom line. There's often a blind eye turn to much training and protective equipment because those things take, take time. They also cost money. Workers sometimes fear reporting pesticide exposure more than the exposure itself. They are afraid of losing their jobs. When it comes to pesticides, does North Carolina's regulatory system put the health of the agricultural industry over the health of its workers? It's too easy, I think, to exploit a workforce like that. There are about 54,000 farmers in our state. Most of them use pesticides to control insects and disease. That means their workers, most of them migrants, work around pesticides on a regular basis. Our state's agricultural industry downplays the risk, but worker advocates say the problem of pesticide exposure is much larger than it appears. Our focal point, does more need to be done to protect the workers who harvest our crops from the pesticides used to help grow them? Salute Solorio worked in North Carolina farm fields for 14 years. Este maíz está bien bonito. He says pesticides made him sick. Like, like nausea, stomach ache, constipation, headaches, weakness. Even the, the growers would get sick. Solorio says the growers didn't provide workers with protective clothing or educate them on how to safely use pesticides. No, at that time we didn't get any, any information, nothing, nothing. This former worker who did not want to be identified blames her kidney failure on pesticide exposure in fields in North Carolina and Florida. Well, when I was uh, working in Florida and I went to the doctor, the, the uh, doctor said that, that my kidneys had been harmed because of the pesticides, because of what they used to, to spray. She said the grower she worked for had little regard for her safety. They just wanted the workers to, to do the job. When you've been out in the field working, have you had any anything sprayed around you? Doctors say the most dangerous pesticides are organophosphates. Well, they're neurotoxins. They, they make your nerves not work correctly. They're used on a wide variety of crops in North Carolina. Mild exposure can cause headache, dizziness, and nausea. And in the most severe exposures, they can lead to coma, difficulty breathing, uh, seizures, and even death. You may have had some exposure to some chemicals that are sprayed on the tobacco. Little is known about the long-term effects of exposure because migratory farm workers are hard to track. But there's an ongoing study of 90,000 pesticide applicators and their families in Iowa and North Carolina that began in 1994. And what we're finding is that people who apply pesticides or who have been exposed to pesticides have increased risk of certain cancers. And that would include prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and colon cancer. Um, and also the childhood um, lymphomas and leukemias are also higher. Worker advocates believe most farmers in North Carolina do what they can to protect their workers because their business depends on them. Some other operations, you know, they're just going to take, you know, whatever workers they can get and try and do it as cheaply as they can. And, and the bottom line is their main motivator. And in those cases, that's where I become really concerned. To advocates like Patterson, Agmart is the poster child for that concern. Agmart is a Florida-based tomato grower with fields in southeastern North Carolina. The EPA asked the State Pesticide Board, which is under the Department of Agriculture, to investigate Agmart in 2005, after three deformed babies were born to women who worked in those fields. One of them, Carlos Candelaria Herrera, was born with no limbs. Earlier this year, Agmart settled a lawsuit with the Herrera family. 
I hope that it means that they've acknowledged some responsibility for, for their role in that child's injuries. Agmart does not. There is no credible scientific evidence to tie uh, the very unfortunate uh, Herrera situation to the chemicals. Ash believes the company decided the benefits of fighting the lawsuit were not worth the costs. There's no question but that the publicity from this situation has just been horrible. Um, Agmart has basically been uh, demonized uh, or criticized uh, in a very significant way. That's not good for its business. Agmart stopped using some of the pesticides suspected in the case. I think it's an acknowledgement that there was a problem to begin with. But Agmart attorneys say the move was a response to customer concern over pesticides and a nationwide trend towards organic growing. Judges threw out most of the 369 charges against Agmart, but the state continues to pursue the case. Regardless of the outcome, advocates say it has exposed deficiencies in the way the state regulates pesticides. I think that this Agmart case has woken up a lot of people to what needs to be done here. For example, under North Carolina law, private pesticide applicators, most of them farmers, can only be cited for a violation if it is willful. Under federal labor regulations, negligence is enough. With an OSHA violation, um, you don't have to prove that, that there was an intent to uh, violate the statute, which you do have to prove for a pesticide violation. At issue in the Agmart case was the so-called restricted entry interval, which is the amount of time that must pass after pesticides are sprayed before a worker can safely re-enter a field. As long as the grower is abiding by that REI and not permitting his farm workers from going into fields before that REI expires, there is little risk associated with the residues that that worker might come in contact with. The state requires growers to record the time a field is sprayed, but not the time workers re-enter the field. That's one reason the state has been unable to prove that Agmart's workers re-entered fields too soon. They are unfortunately not records that enable either us or the state to say that a given worker is in a given field at a particular moment in time. Advocates also want the state to allow workers the right to file confidential complaints. A worker who calls OSHA, for example, to report the lack of a safety guard on a machine can do that without having their name provided to the employer. In the pesticide context, that's not possible. In January, Governor Mike Easley created a task force to address some of those concerns, but its recommendations failed to address many of them. Next, is part of the problem a state agency that advocates for the same industry it regulates? I think there is a definite conflict of interest there. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. Worker safety rules are enforced by the Department of Labor, except when it comes to pesticides. Then in North Carolina, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services enforces them. Worker advocates say that is one reason a special task force did not enact tougher reforms to better protect workers. The Agmart case prompted Governor Easley to appoint a task force on preventing agricultural pesticide exposure. It raised a lot of questions about the protection of farm workers in the fields. State Health Director Leah Devlin chaired the task force. It was made up mostly of experts from state agencies and academic institutions involved in health care and agriculture. While worker advocates had a chance to address the panel, none were on the panel. I think part of the problem is also that the task force was not made up of reformers. It was made up of people who already work in the agencies that we're talking about. The task force did recommend that pesticide applicators record the time they finish spraying a field. Right now, they're only required to put when the, they started spraying. So you really can't calculate the reentry period to you know when the spraying stopped. But the task force did not recommend that applicators take the extra step of recording the time workers re-enter a field after it is sprayed. 
And I think that's a major problem that the Agmark case really brought forward. Did you comply with that time period? Did you send workers in before it was safe, or did you wait like you were supposed to? You know, I think overall we do a, a very good job. Agriculture Commissioner Steve Troxler, who was also on the task force, says farmers can't keep up with what workers are in what fields at any given time. And I think it would be just a regulatory nightmare, and it's something that uh, an unnecessary regulation right now. Troxler also opposed changing the standard that requires pesticide violations to be willful. I think willful has worked all of these years and uh, why change it? My job as chair was... But the chair of the task force questions the standard. In the public health laws, the work that we do, willful is not a part of our way of doing business. The state pesticides division says the standard only applies if it can't negotiate a deal with the violator and must take its case to the pesticide board for a hearing. In 99 percent of our enforcement cases, I'd say, we are able to reach a settlement and we don't have that burden of proving willful. The state did have that burden in the Agmark case. The task force recommended and the legislature passed a law to keep employers from retaliating against workers who file complaints about pesticide violations, but it doesn't guarantee confidentiality for workers who complain. I don't want to see uh, confidentiality become a way that uh, farmers are harassed, and I think that that uh, very well could happen. We're dealing with the issue of confidentiality. Once again, the state's top health official is at odds with the state's top agriculture official. She supports the right to confidentiality. And I think that that is a really a worthy goal, and we need to do that in North Carolina. It's a right workers already have when they file a complaint with the Department of Labor. Although it's nice to be able to tell a worker you, won't, you can't be retaliated against legally, um, it's even better to be able to say your name isn't going to be released in the first place. Let's prevent the problem before it happens. The fear that they have about losing their jobs is very powerful and uh, puts them in a position to, to really you know, put up with um, conditions that most of us were not, um, were not put up with. If workers lose their jobs, they can lose their housing, too. We act on every complaint that we get, whether we have a name or not. But last year, the state pesticide division says it didn't receive a single complaint about violations of its worker protection standard. I mean, it creates a setup where there's an illusion that there is not a problem, uh, that we don't need more inspectors because we don't have a lot of complaints, that we don't have a lot of complaints because there's not a problem, when the reality is, if there are problems, people are afraid to complain. As for pesticide inspectors, there are only 19 to check on 18,000 private applicators, 13,000 commercial applicators, and 700 pesticide dealers. There's always going to be a limit to how many inspectors you can have, so I think we really need to, to bump up the protections for workers who want to file a complaint about what's going on in their workplace so that we can actually do the job with what we have now. Advocates say the language barrier makes it nearly impossible for most workers to phone in complaints. They do not call. They're not going to pick up a phone to make the complaint. Look right up there, and you've worked in the tobacco in previous years. Medical treatment provides another way to track pesticide exposure cases. While there are about 88,000 farm workers in the state, the Division of Public Health reported only 20 cases of confirmed pesticide-related illness in 2007. We kind of feel it's the tip of the iceberg because in most cases, people don't know that their symptoms are related to the pesticides. Advocates also blame barriers from a lack of transportation to clinics to the fear that workers have of telling an employer they are too ill to work. So I think we're missing uh, a large number of people who are being exposed and are, being, are getting sick. Even the state official who oversees enforcement of pesticide regulation says workers often say what they think their employer wants them to say. We have cases all the time where the farmers told us, no, I have not trained, I haven't done this. And if we talk to the workers, they say, well, he has trained me, he has done this. Advocates say the promise of confidentiality would help regulators get to the truth, but the agricultural interest on the task force refused to support it. As chairman, it was lose all the progress we'd made if we continued to push on confidentiality. So, as it did on the willful standard and the reporting of worker reentry times, the task force yielded to its members in agriculture. Do we need to come back to these issues? We absolutely do. And I, the last thing we wanted was a set of recommendations 
that are going to go on the shelf. Instead, the pesticide task force passed recommendations agricultural interests would support, and the legislature would be more likely to pass. But advocates still wonder who's representing the interests of workers. Would it make sense to have uh, the Department of Labor oversee these type worker safety issues? I don't think so. We in agriculture uh, regulate the pesticides and we know the pesticides and you know so it's natural that we also are you know are out uh, looking for worker protection violations because it's part of that pesticide label. Next, getting growers and farm workers to understand that the label is the law when it comes to pesticides. Well we can get the message across we don't know what happens when they go into the fields afterwards. <laughs> You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. When it comes to protecting farm workers, the governor's task force recommended only a fraction of what worker advocates wanted. And the legislature approved only a fraction of that. It includes improved record keeping and more money for worker education. But advocates say it falls short of what's really needed. Um, These educators then, from the um, Farm Worker Health Program in Watauga <laughs> County are training workers how to protect themselves from pesticides. Esta hombre está enferma por los pesticidas. They say most growers in the area make an honest effort to keep their workers safe, but they have seen workers sickened by pesticide exposure. And these are growers who might not be as careful, they might be spraying close to where the workers are, they might not be giving them the equipment they need. Es un letrero de advertencia. Mm -hmm. This program shows workers the equipment they need, how to request it from their employer if they don't have it, and how to report one who won't provide it. The need for training and the need for bilingual training is really paramount. Based on the recommendations of the Pesticide Task Force, the legislature funded two more people to help with worker training. But some advocates say there's too much emphasis on making workers responsible for their own job safety. When the Department of Agriculture offered to send more worker education materials to a farm worker health program in western North Carolina, its director refused the offer and asked for better enforcement of pesticide laws instead. She wrote in an email, we need your superiors to protect the identity of the people who file complaints and then to investigate and act on the results of the investigation and do something other than ask the grower to promise to do better in the future. Most workers don't have the power to change their job site, no matter how much training they've had. So if we put the onus on them to prevent pesticide exposure, we're not going to do the job. We really have to focus on making the job site safer and do the training and education. But if the job site isn't safe to begin with, workers don't have the power to fix that. The chemical is dimethylate. That puts the onus on growers to make sure their workers have protective clothing and to post signs alerting workers when a field has been sprayed. You're breaking the law if you go above that labeled rate. Learning how to protect themselves and their workers is part of the training growers must have to get a license to apply pesticides. The dangerous pesticides are those which are basically not applied correctly. Matthew Horney applies a common herbicide to control weeds around his Christmas trees and a more toxic insecticide to kill mites on the shrubs at his nursery. If you don't wear the proper equipment, it is very dangerous. He says he's trained his workers to protect themselves. And they're very good about wearing their equipment, their safety glasses and everything like that. He helped us with videos and also with the equipment we need more than anything. We wash our hands well, we bathe ourselves well when we get home, we wash our clothes. Because if you know, take the right direction, maybe you can become sick, right? But what about growers who are not so conscientious? When there is a problem and the workers do want to report, um, there's not a lot of incentive for them to do that. Um, it seemed to have caused more problems for them than it's helped. Como los pesticidas le pueden hacer. Some advocates say that makes training like this even more important. Next, will farmers ever be able to eliminate pesticides altogether? If you think of something that is going to actually kill a pest, Obviously, that carries with it danger to the person that's handling it. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the issues covered in this episode of Focal Point, visit WRAL.com. 
click on news and then documentaries. Because they are dangerous, pesticides are also controversial. Some say the only way to eliminate the controversy and the danger is to eliminate pesticides. Farmers say they'd love to. But with the large-scale farming needed to meet today's demand for food, is that even possible? All I have to do is move the foliage and they just fly out everywhere. John Volmer's got beetles in his zucchini and worms in his snap beans. There they are right there. But putting up with more pests is the price of organic farming. Insects and diseases are, are always there and they're always present. We've just learned to live with a few more holes and a little more imperfection in our fruits and vegetables than what we had before. The downside of organic culture is that sometimes you have these kinds of things happen to you. Volmer used to be a pesticide dealer and still grows some crops conventionally, but gradually he's transitioning to organic farming using natural pesticides instead of toxic chemicals. There's a better way to raise crops and vegetables in a sustainable way with less use of pesticides and in a more natural system. But it's one thing for a small farmer like Volmer to grow a few organic crops and quite another for farmers to adopt those techniques system-wide. I don't think that they could maintain uh, anything close to the level of productivity that's required now. There are some crops that are very difficult to produce in or with organic means, uh, especially on a large scale. Volmer agrees, but says progress is being made. He's using an organic pesticide to kill worms. But it has no effect on anybody or the environment beyond a worm. I think that is unique uh, chemistry. Volmer says more products like that will be developed as the demand for organic food grows. If a label came on your tomato that told you what all the chemicals were used, how much water pollution that caused, you know, how many incidents of poisoning could be connected to that, people wouldn't buy that tomato. Supporters of organic farming say chemical-free tomatoes benefit not only the people who eat them, but also the people who harvest them. I think there is a moral obligation to treat workers as, you know, as fully people and to be just as concerned about their families as we are about our own families.